think the technology aspect is very important, but it's not for me the, the main thing. Like for me, it's about the idea. And then it's about how, what do I need? What tools do I need in order to make that idea visible or to feel that idea? And therefore, um, I would say the idea or the emotions come before the technology. My work is all about creating a story and creating an emotional moment in a physical space. And now these days that could also be a digital space, but a space that a human would, would move in, whether digital or physical. And actually, for me, it's really about the idea. After you have the emotion that you want to reflect, then I think then it's about bringing technology and what kind of means, how are you going to do that? How are you going to take what's in your head, your emotional moment, and make that uh, visual for people to uh, explore and experience? I'm Lee Sachwitz. I'm the founder of Flora Fauna Visions, a design studio in Berlin, working internationally. And I came to, from Glasgow, Scotland, to Berlin in, on the 1st of November, 1993. And I was an architect. I just finished my studies as an architect and I was looking for fun and adventure. And I found it here in Berlin and got heavily involved in a lot of the artistic and electronic music projects back then. So I would say at the right place at the right time. And uh, through that, I developed my love for light and projections and storytelling um, combined with music. And in 1999, I decided to make that hobby into a profession and founded my design studio, Flora Fauna Visions. I come from a background, a family background, where we were always taught as kids to experiment, not to be afraid, uh, to go for things, to trust in your own Bauchgefühl uh, in German, so your, your gut feeling. And now when I look back on that time, I realize that my dad was quite a big influence on me because in, when I was 14, he opened a space in Glasgow called the Videodrome. But this was 1985, so we'd never really seen anything with projections or any of that stuff. And his concept was to kind of beam in different types of things like MTV videos or Super Bowl uh, live uh, finals and to show all this stuff on big video projectors. And he installed the first video projectors, I think, ever in the UK. I'm not sure about that, but uh, for me, it felt like that at the time. And they had, you know, like the RGB, like the red, green, blue separated, these huge big things with these huge big lenses. And um, yeah, and my dad said, come, come have a look and let's hang out. And we would uh, hang out at the ground control, we used to call it, where there was a big, huge computer where you could type messages on a huge keyboard. And when I look back at that time, later in the future or now or 15 years ago, I think like, oh, I didn't realize that actually that was going to influence me in the future. I went on to study architecture at the Glasgow School of Art and we were always being taught to experiment. For us, it was all about solving a problem in space. And that problem isn't any different, whether it's a temporary space or an architectural building, it's all about solving how a person, a human, moves around in that space. We can learn so much from Leonardo da Vinci today because even me, after spending a year intensely on this topic, could not ever have put all of the stuff that he was thinking about into one show. I really had to curate the moments and we can learn so much about his thoughts and about his style, his technique um, and his ideas by looking at his work, looking at how his work influenced so many different people from so many different walks of life throughout time. It's amazing. When you look at, I don't know, if you think about maybe the most obvious, The Last Supper, and then think about how many versions of that picture exists throughout time since he painted it. It's mind-blowing. I structured the show and picked the parts which inspired me the most, I would say, as the creative director, because in the end it's not Leonardo's work, it's 
Flora Fauna Visions work, so we have to find a way to find this balance. And of course, there were key moments. There's three real key moments, um, which of course were, were chosen, which have to be in the show. The Last Supper, the Mona Lisa and the Vitruvian Man. Um, but what they represent and how they're integrated and what my thoughts are around these different moments is very individual and very much uh, coming from the time that we live in now and our own you know, interpretation of his work. You travel kind of into the future, into the moment that imagine Da Vinci would wake up today after five, I think 503 years after his death and he would look at the world through the eyes of today and he would look back and see like what happened, how did the screw that I developed for my helicopter or for the helicopter, how did this then, you know, like kind of back to the future influence time over the last 500 years and where are we when it comes to inventions or flying machines or music machines or uh, row, rowing machines or catapults or all these different things. And that's kind of one side of it. And the other side of it is also like what happens to the world. So the environmentalist side, Da Vinci was completely obsessed with water. The flow of water, it went down to like the flow of blood through the, through the body. And he was really, really fascinated by nature and how the humans move and react in the environment. And then, of course, there's the, the section which reflects on him as a painter. So what is it he was thinking about, the Last Supper, the Mona Lisa, and so on. So it's really a show with, where it's with something for everybody. The choice for using projection is because the atmosphere in the space is just way more beautiful than LED. You know, it's like you feel the ray of light, you feel the beam of light which is coming from the projectors even though we don't have you know, a smoke machine or whatever to see it, but it's just a much softer atmosphere and most of the time when we use LED we work on a big stage where there's maybe a lot of other light, so if you're working in that way then it's hard to compete all the time with projection um, or we may be working on something which um, is happens in daylight um, or d different reasons but for this kind of immersive experience I believe that projection is definitely a much more creates a much more beautiful atmosphere and in this space there's kind of three different elements which are being projected on we have the outside walls which we call the immersive space then we have the floor so 360 degrees walls, complete floor, and in the center of the room, we also have an object, and that's also being used um, for projection, which is really exciting because it means that you can't ever see the whole room at the same time, which was very important for me because I, I wanted people to stay curious and I wanted them to move around. So you can sit down for a minute, but as soon as the next image happens, you're going to get up and move around because you want to see it from this side or from this side or from this side because there's always the, the centerpiece, which is in a way like helping you move around the space. We have a bunch of projectors in the rig um, for the walls and for the floors. And we have, of course, the entire space, which is interactive. So we have all the sensors and the cameras and all this stuff in there as well. For the technical implementation of the Genius Immersive Experience, producer Barrialis Interactive Group cooperated with other technical partners. On site, the team was supported by Pixway in the area of video technology and by Amtec for the installation of the DNB Soundscape system. The massive projection area is over 1000 square meters. 32 Panasonic laser projectors of the type PTRZ990 and PTRZ120 were flown. In the background a sophisticated system of disguised VX4 media servers and disguised RX2 is at work. Here we are in Berlin at the Genius Immersive Experience and we're just about to enter the canvas. The space is about 900 square meters and everything happens in the one space. So the walls are about five meter high. We've got north, south, east, west. It's about 25 or 30 meters long. And if you look up to the rig, you can see, I 
think you can see the immersive sound system on the outside walls and in the center. You can also see the different projectors hanging. If you look really closely, you can see the, the cameras for the tracking and for the interactive moments. And we built this space, you know, with the centerpiece of the cube, which for us was kind of like inside Da Vinci's crazy creative mind. If you go with us in the center of the cube, there's also a beautiful analog object. I, I'm a big believer in keeping the magic magic. We had a lot of discussions about whether we would put in a roof or not, but yeah, the decision was to, um, to leave the rig because it's kind of impressive. And then we also see that the projectors are from Panasonic. Great company. So I think it's also cool, like the genius immersive experience for me when looking back at the last year, it kind of takes like so many different influences and things that you've learned and done and thought about over the years and combines these into a show. And I think there is a very strong electronic moment. So one of the scenes is very influenced through kind of, I don't know, creating like the most perfect club environment to me. Music is super important for this show because we're triggering all different types of senses. You know, we're triggering touch, movement, your hearing, your visual. And so of course, mute, the impact of music plays a huge role. And to do this, we teamed up with a wonderful producer from London, DJ Sasha. For Sasha, it was super exciting to work in this space. I believe it was the first immersive sound project that he'd worked on. And he was super excited to hear how, for example, you can have the soundtrack in the space, but when you walk up to the wall and there's something happening which you're going to interact with or where you're being invited to interact with, there's actually a specific sound happening there which you can hear, which triggers, is being triggered by video. So we have many layers, you know, we have the soundtrack, which is created by, by Sasha. We have the interactive sounds, and then we also have the special effects in the space. So we have a moment where the wave, a wave of water kind of comes in, crashes into the center of the room. And this, for example, has a really powerful water, nature, sound effect on it. So all these different layers together with the immersive sound system, there's 48 speakers inside the room positioned obviously very beautifully by DB Audio. Um, so, you know, it's really an immersive sound experience as much as it is a visual experience. The technical aspect of the show is completely customized for this space. In the process of implementing, there were about 17 versions of the software written as we went. So it was implementing, research development, problem solving, visually looking, feeling how it was, checking that it was working, writing an update, writing an update, and all this, this whole process was beta testing until we got to the final result. The project was created from the creative point of view using a VR system. So we had the opportunity as we moved through time and got closer to the images that we wanted uh, the show to be created with, uh, we built a VR suite so that we could look in and move around and see how these images looked in space. The team at Flora Fauna Visions was about 25 different people in the creation team, from art direction to very specific uh, types of programmers or designers. So you'd have a Houdini artist for one certain element, an After Effects artist for another, and a Notch developer for something else, and another part which is done in touch design and all of these different elements came together for us in a kind of 3D timeline that we built. So we had the, the show coded, so on time code. We built the room in cinema, so cinema 4D, and you could basically take a camera shot from the top and see the whole space, or you could zoom in and see just one corner. So we had the opportunity to look kind of from the eye of the visitor into the space and we would map I think it was like one sixth resolution. So 20, yeah, 20% 20 or no less. So 20% of the re resolution is what we would render out to look at, to see in the whole space on 3D. 
and then we would zoom in and render frames because of course with all these all these projectors the size of the project is huge so you have to work in this type of way in order to see what you're doing and to understand how this experience comes together ultimately it only comes together fully when you see it in the space that it's going to be shown in the combination of projection interactive technology augmented reality being able to really kind of paint your own pictures being in a space where the soundtrack is very very important and takes you on a journey all these things are very important in order to spark in the end an emotional create an emotional moment which ultimately sparks the creativity in each and every one of us the parallel to leonardo da vinci when creating a immersive experience in 2022 was really funny throughout the year because i thought like we're actually doing exactly the same as what he's doing when he paints a picture or when he's sketching because you have a blank canvas right he puts his first stroke he puts his next stroke and the painting gets more detailed as you go along and with us creating this room is kind of the same it's like you're beamed into this space and this space can be anything you want it to be and it's such a amazing creative challenge to bring all of these pieces into like filling up this canvas to create a one hour show full of many different images and interactions so it's been an amazing creative journey for me and also like in a way a personal masterpiece